welcome <laughs> everyone to this week's uh, talk in Durham Geometry and Topology. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Mara Ungureano yeah, from uh, uh, University of Freiburg in Germany. So it is the Rasoro Algebras and Universal Polynomials. So thank you, Mara. Yeah, thank you, Fernando, for the opportunity to speak uh, in your seminar. So um, as you can probably guess uh, from the title, uh, the main character in today's talk is going to be a counting problem in algebraic geometry. So this means that I would like to find out the number of some geometric objects that satisfy certain conditions. So I will begin by introducing uh, the, the objects of interest, but afterwards I will actually have to say a few words about their moduli space, so about the space that parameterizes these, uh, these objects, because it turns out that once you ask an enumerative question, you are actually asking a question about the topology and geometry of the moduli space uh, parameterizing the objects that we count. And this is actually where the fun, where the fun begins, because these moduli spaces are really interesting uh, objects in their own right. So they tend to uh, both inherit properties uh, from the objects that they parameterize, but they also exhibit structures that were not there and could not be seen with the naked eye just by looking at uh, one, one object of interest. So in, in our situation, we're going to see um, examples of both of these phenomena. And uh, in particular, we're going to see some nice structures like Virasor algebras and some things called universal polynomials that uh, pop up in, uh, in our problem. And then we're going to try to go uh, back to our counting problem and try to use uh, these nice structures or at least investigate to what extent uh, we can use these interesting structures to answer uh, questions about counting uh, my objects. So let's begin uh, with the counting problem. So what I want to do is to find the number of E secant planes to a projective curve. So this is an old problem. It goes back to the 1800s in the work of uh, Cayley and Castelnuovo. But luckily, there are still uh, open questions that we can uh, that we can consider. And in particular, I'd like to now um, set once and for all what I mean. So a projective curve for me, this is just a one dimensional variety living inside a projective space. Usually my projective spaces will have dimension R. And what I mean by that is that it's actually the vanishing locus. So it's the it's cut out of the projective space by homogeneous polynomials. Okay. And the E secant plane, well, this is just a plane, as you might imagine. So this is a plane in PR. So this is just a plane, is a copy of the projective space of dimension lower than the projective space in which we live. And it's a, such a plane that intersects our curve in E points. Mm. Okay. And now uh, let's just actually illustrate this by an example. So my example, let's take like the simplest thing you could uh, have in mind. This is a plane cubic. Uh, so for me, uh, again, so we live in the projective space. It's a plane cubic current in P2. So this is cut out of a homogeneous polynomial of degree three and three variables, x, y, and z. Uh, but here, I just give you its possible equation uh, as an affine, in its affine version. So here, I, I'm dehomogenizing with respect to the z variable, because in some sense, this is closer <laughs> to the truth, because I cannot really draw in projective space. But anyway, so we are considering now a plane cubic curve. Um, and in P2, and now let's see what are the possible planes uh, in, uh, in this situation. Well, the planes in P2, the only possible planes are lines. And Bezu's theorem tells me that, well, if I have a line, then it will have to intersect a cubic, which has degree three, in exactly three points. Right, so in some sense, this, uh, this problem in, in this context is not quite so interesting because, of course, any line will intersect my curve in three points. So every line is a three secant line, which means that I'm not, I can't really count anything. I just have an infinitely many. But I do want to use this example to draw uh, your attention to a certain aspect. Namely, when I say, and when I use Bezu's theorem, and when I mean an E secant plane, I'm also taking 
um, the multiplicity of intersection into account. So you see, when we use Bezu's theorem and we say that um, a line intersects my curve, in this case, in three points, I don't care whether it intersects the curve in this way, where all the intersection points here are transverse intersections, or if I have, for example, I have an intersection with multiplicity two here, so it's I have a tangency, or and here it's uh, it's transverse, or if I even have higher multiplicity of intersections. So if I have here an intersection of the curve with the line with multiplicity three. So for me, uh, these things are all the same. I, I whenever I say E C plane, I really count with multiplicity. And what is this mysterious multiplicity? Well, you can just understand it as a generalization of the multiplicity of a root of a polynomial. So for example, you know, let's just take the xy plane. This is the xy plane. And let's just take some curve here given by some polynomial f. And let's say that the intersection with the x-axis is x0. And so if my f here is given by x minus x0 to the power m, then I say, of course, that the root x0 has multiplicity m. And so now for us, this situation, what, what this is telling you here when I write 3p1 here, what I'm saying is that locally, locally at this point, um, I have such as I have my, my situation is described if you want by a polynomial that has a power of three here. So this is kind of the a generalization of this situation is what the multiplicity here um, is telling me. So in conclusion, um, in the plane, the situation is not particularly interesting because I know exactly how how in how many points a line will intersect my my curve, and I know. Um, that this is not, uh, yeah, I cannot count infinitely many such curves. Um, and secondly, I also know now that when I make easy complaints, I'm really counting with multiplicity. So I don't care if that my situation is like this or like this or like that. And of course, what I have said before about Bezu, it's not just about uh, curves of degree three, it's about curves of any degree D, so that are cut out uh, by uh, homogeneous polynomials of degree whatever, uh, d greater or equal to one. OK, so since we are now in kind of a boring situation, let's try to, uh, or rather, are there any questions so far? No? Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, so you said something about e-secant lines rather than planes there? Yeah, because uh, the planes in P2 are all lines, <laughs> apart from the oh, hyperplanes, you mean? Uh, Yes, but they can also be less than hyperplane. So a line is oh, also I, a plane, okay. a smaller plane I inside P okay. R of higher R. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's try to do a more interesting uh, example. Let's now go higher in dimension of the projective space where I live. And let's consider a smooth curve of degree D inside this projective space. So from now on, my curves are all going to be smooth. And uh, what does it mean to say that it has degree D? Well, it means to say that if I take a hyperplane and I intersect my curve with it, then it will intersect my curve in D points. Again, count it with multiplicity. So again, uh, in this case, I'm not really interested in counting D secant planes to my projective curve. I'm interested in something a bit, uh, a bit less trivial. Uh, and in particular, for example, I could look at lines that intersect my curve. Uh, inside a projective space of dimension R. So let's see what happens here. Do I have a chance of counting anything, for example? Well, let's stick with uh, R equals to three. So I'm taking the dimension of my projective space to be three. And let's say that uh, I'm, I'm looking at lines that intersect my curve in three points. And here, I again, apparently it turns out that I have infinitely many three secant lines. Okay, that's not very good. But then if I increase uh, the E by one, so if I take now E equals to four, it turns out that I have finitely many secant lines to see. So here I might have begin to, to start counting. But if I take E equals to five, then I have no secant lines to see in general. So 
hmm, that is kind of suspicious. And again, for example, if I now uh, consider r equals to four, so if I move even higher in dimension and I take e, e equals to four, then I have no four secant lines to see, but infinitely many four secant two planes. So when I'm in R4, then I can consider two planes. Um, so that's not very good. And I also have no secant, no five secant lines in P4 to a curve, but infinitely many five secant two planes. So what I'm trying to show you by this is that somehow the parameters, where I'm changing the parameters, things happen in a very non-trivial way. So there must be something uh, going on here that I'm not really telling you yet. Uh, and you might, of course, uh, quite legitimately wonder where do all these numbers come from? And the answer is that they actually come from the dimension theory, so really from the geometry of the moduli space of E secant planes to a smooth projective curve. So how do we understand this moduli space in order to also recover these numbers that I'm telling you about? Well, you could do it in various ways, but I would like to uh, go on this idea, which is to turn the extrinsic geometry of the curve into intrinsic geometry. So usually the way you do this, you have a recipe, which tells you that instead of considering the curve inside the projective space, so cut out with some polynomials in the projective space, you could see it as an abstract manifold. So living, you know, Absolutely. I mean, it doesn't live anywhere. It's just an abstract manifold with an extra structure, namely with a line bundle on top of it. And more precisely, what you can now say, if you believe this recipe, is that a curve of degree d in PR is actually the same thing. So a, an embedded curve in PR is the same thing as an abstract curve with a line bundle L that has degree d and whose dimension of the space of sections is r plus one. Um, so what does, this, what, is this what does this degree do exactly? Well, sorry, you can see the degree in the following way. So if you consider sections of, uh, of this line bundle here, let's call them SI. If you consider these sections, then if you consider all their zeros and order their poles and you add their coefficients with positive signs for zeros and negative signs for poles, these number, this number has to add up to D. This is what it means for a line bundle to have degree D. So again, curve of degree D in PR is the same thing as an abstract curve with a line bundle whose sections have this property, namely the vector space of sections has dimension R plus one and uh, the coefficients of the zeros and poles uh, add up to D. And then you can also write down the exactly how, how you can understand this guy as this guy. Well, you basically have a map that sends each point here to this point here in projective space where S0 up to SR are a basis of the space of sections. So this is kind of how you, um, how you translate um, this guy from equations in projective space to something that does not really involve that. Um, but of course, um, we were talking about uh, planes that intersect my curve. So how does this, how does this language actually help us? So I will tell you how you translate the condition of the of a plane being secant. Um, and in fact, before I do that, I also want to refine a little bit what I'm saying because you see. I'm, I always said E secant plane, but you see, sometimes I've had a line, sometimes I had a two plane, what is going on here? Well, I would like to introduce an extra parameter F to make my life a little bit easier and to explain what this guy does. Well, let's take E equals to three. And if I take E equals to three, then you see that, okay, I have three points. Three points can either be collinear and if they're collinear, then they span, oops, a line, which is what I call a one plane, or they can also span a plane. Yeah, and this is what I call a two plane. And I want to dist I want to use this parameter f to distinguish between these two situations. And you see that if I use this notation here, my line as a one plane will be the situation where f is equal to one. Uh, while the two plane will be the situation where F 
is equal to zero. So I use this parameter here, f, really to be able to, to distinguish between these situations to make my life a little bit easier and also to be more precise. So now I ask you to believe me because uh, uh, perhaps it's a bit much to, to understand exactly why this is true, but I would like you to believe me that the condition that uh, a certain plane that I have an E secant E minus F minus one plane is exactly equivalent to the following situation, namely that I have E points P1 up to PE in C not necessarily distinct, uh, such that the dimension of the space of sections that vanish on these guys, on these points, so this is what this space here is telling me, is at least R plus one minus E plus F. So this, uh, this condition here basically comes from the translation of this, uh, of my problem into this language of line bundles on curves. And this is how uh, we are going to now consider my moduli problem. Instead of trying to parameterize really planes using some Grismanians or whatever, I am instead going to parameterize points on the curve satisfying this property here. Okay, so this is what uh, we are going to do now. And uh, what do I need first? I first need to understand what are these, you know, how can I understand E tuples of points on C? Well, for this, I have uh, the notion of the symmetric product of the curve. So tuples of points P1 up to PE are parameterized by, uh, here I take the ETH product. So this is E times of the curve with itself and I quotient it by the action of the symmetric product because I don't care about the order and so on of the points. And this guy turns out to be also a smooth and projective variety. So that's very nice. So this is what, um, this is what I have here. And then I want to somehow extract out of this guy exactly those points that satisfy this property. And to do so, uh, I will set up a morphism of bundles on top of this symmetry problem. So how am I going to do that? Well, first of all, um, I'm going to look, I'm going to now try to translate um, the condition that the tuple of points belongs to the moduli space of interest, which by the way, I'm denoting it by VE, E minus FL. I want to translate this condition into some kind of uh, property of a linear map. I'm going to linearize my problem. This is like a standard procedure in enumerative geometry. So how do I do that? Well, let's see what map I have set up here. Here I have a map that takes me from the space of sections of the line bundle. So I have S here. And what it does, it evaluates at the points uh, that I'm considering. So I'm evaluating. I'm going to write this here with like this kind of formal sum. I'm hinting at the fact that these guys are divisors uh, on the curve, but I, I don't want to, to really go into that uh, language right now. In any case, this map here, phi, it takes a section of the line bundle and it evaluates it at the points. And of course you notice now that the sections that I'm interested in, so the guys here, these are exactly the ones that vanish on P1 up to PE, on the points P1 to PE. So this means that if this guy is the guy of interest, then uh, it sits in the kernel of this map phi. So basically what I'm saying now is that this guy is the kernel of phi. Okay. Very good. I now I understand this. And now what else do I know? Well, I told you already that this guy has dimension R plus one. And now I hope you also believe me that this guy has dimension E. And so if, if I put everything together, if the kernel, I can say that this guy, this tuple here belongs to my moduli space of interest, if and only if it belongs to the kernel. So if and only if this kernel has dimension R plus one minus E plus F, but this is equivalent to saying that the rank of phi is less um, or equal to E minus F. This just follows from the rank uh, rank nullity theorem. And so I can put everything together because here I just analyzed one point of interest, 
but I really want to cut out of CE. So I want to cut out of this guy, all the points P that belong here. And what, what the way you do it is basically you, you have the bundle version of this map. This is just like the fiber version of it. Uh, so you set up a bundle map from E to LE. I will tell you in a second how these guys are. So this guy E, this is the trivial vector bundle that has these fibers. And this guy LE is a so-called tautological vector bundle that has these guys as fibers. And these two guys, they live on top of the symmetric product. And what I've told you by now uh, is that this space that I'm interested in of E secant, of e secant planes is basically the, the locus inside of CE where this bundle map phi has rank less or equal to E minus F. So this is now how I have translated my problem uh, into an intrinsic problem about the, the curve. So if, if you remember nothing else about this problem, uh, I mean, the only thing that's, or rather, let, let me reformulate. The one thing that is important to remember about this moduli space is that this guy is the locus inside of CE where a certain bundle map drops rank and it's so-called degeneracy locus. And that these two bundles, they're particularly, one of them is particularly simple because it's trivial and the other one is this very interesting bundle called the tautological bundle that pops up um, in many spaces. Um, and because we have this construction, we have also various advantages. So for example, these degeneracy loci, if, if you have a situation described by a degeneracy locus, like this one here, where, where, the, where the, a bundle map drops rank, for example, then you have various results kind of for free. So for one of the things that you get for free is that um, if you know that this guy is non-empty, then you know that its dimension is at least this. So this comes out of some computation. Um, and that's very nice because you see, we're getting closer to understanding when can we finally count? When do we expect at least to have finitely many uh, EC complaints? And in fact, there's been a lot of work done by, uh, by, very many, by, by many people like uh, Kotterl and Farkas and also myself to try to understand um, a bit better when this guy actually has dimension exactly equal uh, to this because it's actually not, it, it's actually much more complicated than it sounds. Um, but indeed, Kotrel and Farkas have showed uh, that in, in most cases that you can think of, this, this guy uh, is indeed, you have an equality, uh, that the guy, that this space here is non empty when you expect it to be non empty. Um, have also looked, I have also looked, for example, at situations where we look at, uh, you know, why don't we consider intersections of these, of two such guys and see whether they intersect or not, because not only is this, you know, just a question you can answer, this actually also have really nice uh, geometric uh, interpretations as to whether a curve has certain kind of singularities or not. So this is very rich and uh, it's very, um, it's a, it's, 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 you, you need quite a lot of machinery to be able to get uh, to make such kind of statements. But for us today, we are going to just assume that this guy just holds for a second uh, so that we can finally start counting, right? So we are going to assume now that this guy has a dimension equal to this and that this guy is equal to zero. And the parameters that I gave you before at the beginning of the talk, when we had finitely many, they were exactly satisfying this condition that E minus F times R plus one minus E plus F is equal to zero. So this is how um, I found those cases. And if this guy was strictly greater than zero, those were the cases where um, there, was, uh, there were infinitely many. And if when it was less, strictly less than zero, it was the situation when it was empty. Anyway, but let's uh, now focus on the situation here. So we can finally count how many such planes we have um, that are secant to a curve in the projective space. And how do we count? Well, usually we compute an integral. And this integral 
is uh, a computation in, uh, if you want, in the cohomology uh, of the symmetric product of the curve. So the way it turns out is because this guy has uh, dimension zero, then you can see that this is a class, the fundamental class of this guy is going to be a cohomology class of degree E. And this, the fundamental class of the symmetric product is a homology class of degree E. So then by Poincare duality, uh, we are going to have that the integral it's going to be some number. Um, and this is going to give me the count that I'm looking for. And now the thing is that if this number is positive, then I can, you know, very easily say that, yes, it means that this guy is not empty, this moduli space. But if it's, if it's not clearly positive, and I'll, I'll show you in a second what I, what I mean by that, then you have to work a little bit harder to show that this guy here is non-empty when you expect it to be non-empty. Okay, uh, so what I would also like to say is that, okay, so I tell you this, but what does this class even look like? I mean, do I have even a chance uh, to do this computation? But indeed we have, and this is another advantage of using degeneracy uh, loci. So space is given by, by uh, by the locus of points where some bundle map drops rank because we have this so-called Porteous formula. And the Porteous formula gives me exactly, uh, it tells me exactly how the class of this guy looks. This is just by principles, uh, by following uh, the, the formula for degeneracy locus. And what are these guys? These are all churn classes. And surprise, surprise, they are churn classes of this tautological bundle that I introduced before. So as you can see, it's, it's, uh, it pops up again and it's very important. And okay, you might say, okay, it's a determinant of many churn classes, can we compute? You, we should be able to compute this quite easily, right? Um, and indeed, McDonald has done this computation already in 58, but the problem is that the formula is really, really complicated. And one of its, if you want, biggest uh, complications is that we cannot really tell uh, whether the numbers are po always positive or not. So this is indeed uh, the problem that, that we have. And while there are already partial results uh, in, in quite a lot of cases by Farkash and Cotterill and so on, it is not fully clear um, that these numbers are, are indeed positive. So this is something that uh, I would like to talk about. And basically what I would like you to remember from here is that if we are able to count these things. So if we are in this situation, what we are really interested in, in doing is integrating over the fundamental class of CE, a very complicated polynomial in churn classes of this tautological bundle. So this is somehow um, our big task um, to understand something like this. And so there are a few questions, natural questions that come up. And one question is, for example, okay, so I have, first of all, I have a line bundle here that I constructed using a line bundle that I had on the curve. And I'm also have here the symmetric product, which is also made up well of the curve itself. So of course you want to ask, you ask yourself, is there a relationship between cohomology classes of the symmetric product and uh, those of the curve and between the classes of this line bundle and the initial line bundle that, um, that we started with. And that is one, one thing we would like to understand. And also we would like to understand, is there some hidden structure in any of these things that could perhaps help us also then obtain nicer expressions than we had before? So this is, uh, this is something that I would like to tell you about in, uh, in what follows. So uh, are there any questions? So uh, maybe a quick question. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, where do you use the fact that the, that this is a, a curve? I mean, these ideas with ah. the line bundles and so on, you can do that for it, for smooth manifolds, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, exactly. So yeah. I'm using that it's a curve first and foremost, because otherwise the symmetric product would not be smooth ah, okay. and yeah. would not be, yeah. 
And actually, I, I'm going to tell you a few things about surfaces now. And when you move on to higher dimensional varieties, you cannot use the symmetric product anymore. Mm -hmm. You start having to use other things and things become much more complicated. But mm -hmm. yes, indeed, you can use these ideas. You can set this second thing up for any uh, dimension or variety of any dimension. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank and, you. Yeah, no, no, very good question. Thanks. Um, very good. So in fact, now I would like to, to try to answer the first two questions here, or at least give you a hint of what uh, this, you know, what is there that people know. And I'd like to mention uh, the work of Krasnovsky and Nakajima and also a bit later Len. Uh, so this is really quite a nice story because it was motivated uh, by two uh, quite different, uh, if you want, um, sources. So one of them was a really mathematical result of Goethe. He had a, a formula and um, computing uh, Poincare generating functions of Poincare polynomials of, um, of Hilbert schemes of points uh, of a surface. And um, on the other hand, you have this uh, very physical motivation because Wappa and Witten had a conjecture uh, where they came, that stated that the generating func uh, function of the Euler characteristic of uh, the moduli space of instantons is uh, also modular. So basically these two things are basically the same. And what they're basically both saying is that something is modular and it looks even like the character of a, of a certain representation. So <laughs> uh, the point is here that uh, these uh, mathematicians here, so independently Nakajima, Krasnovsky, and also later Len, tried to make sense of this from a geometric point of view. And now both of the motivations that uh, I just mentioned uh, just now, they don't really have anything to do with curves. They have to do with the same setup for projective surfaces. So just imagine everything I said so far, but replace curve with surface and replace uh, something like CE, replace it with, well, I'm going to write it XE. It's, it's really not, it, it, it really should be something like XE to be precise. So this is not quite the symmetric product of the surface. It's the Hilbert scheme of points of the surface. It's also smooth and so on. But to me, it plays the same role as it's the guy that parameterizes E points on the on my surface. So just just understand it like this. Um, okay, very good. So what did they do? I don't want to um, throw too much notation at you, and so I'm not going to insist very much on this. But I, I think it's a really nice story. So I'll just want to say a few words about it. So what they did was they constructed some operators, so, so basically linear maps for all integers um, n. Uh, so they constructed these linear maps Qn that take you from the cohomology of uh, the of your surface uh, to the endomorphisms of this guy. So you see here you take the cohomology of your Hilbert scheme of points, but you don't just take one of them, you take all of them. And that's actually really important. Otherwise, nothing, none of this works. And then what they saw is that these guys actually satisfy these really nice commutation relations, and they also give you a representation of the Heisenberg algebra on this guy here. Okay, very good. What else happens? Um, you are also, if if you write these things up in in this uh, in this setup, you also have a chance of understanding the relation of the cohomology or the Chern classes of the tautological bundle, uh, with you know in relation with the Chern classes of, uh, of the line bundle that you started with. And indeed, in this setup, you can write down an expression like this. So that's quite interesting. You see, you have the generating function of the churn, total churn of the tautological on this side. And on the other side, you also have here, OK, it's a bit complicated. You have an exponential of some infinite series. But here you have the churn, the total churn of the, of the line bundle that you started with. So that's quite pretty. And you can also construct something even more uh, complicated. You can uh, arrange all of these operators in this way. You can so construct new operators Ln and L0, where delta is basically the push forward of the diagonal morphism in cohomology. And what you end up is with a, a Virasoro algebra with central charge given by this guy. So what the, uh, what is really surprising here is that you know you start with a very geometric setup and you end up with the algebra of symmetries of a two-dimensional conformal field theory. So it's uh, really quite fascinating. And as far as I know, 
we don't really know, okay, how, how far can you push this from a physical point of view, for example. And also, unfortunately, um, I also don't, I don't know, or rather, as far as I have seen, it doesn't really help us so much with the computation of the, or with simplifying the formulas that we had before. But it certainly gives us a glimpse of what extra structure you have there. And uh, that is certainly something that I'm thinking about uh, right now, whether we can use this to actually improve uh, what we have before in our computations. Uh, but anyway, this is, I think, a really nice story. Um, but I also mentioned something about universal polynomials. And here we get back to actually trying to answer the question of whether we can obtain nicer expressions for polynomials in your classes of a topological bundle. And here, this is where these universal polynomials uh, come in because a very nice result from the 2000s by Ellingsrud, Goethe, and Len, and later improved by Renamo to work for uh, varieties of any dimension, but we only care for, we are back to the curve situation now. Anyway, this result tells you that an, the integral that I'm interested in is actually nothing more than a polynomial in these guys. And that is extremely helpful because this guy is actually the degree of the curve. And this guy, I can see it or, as one minus the genus of the curve. So what is actually happening here is that what I'm telling you is that the integral of the class of the secant variety, so the integral of such a polynomial is a polynomial itself and that depends only on the degree of the curve and on the genus of the curve. So that's uh, an extremely powerful result. And indeed, actually, uh, if you check it for the case f equals to one, so f is that extra parameter that I introduced to be able to, um, to have a slight, a finer understanding of my, of my secant planes. If I take f equals to one, um, people have already computed quite nice formulas for these secant planes, uh, for the numbers of secant planes. For example, we have this really nice generating function. And you can see from the way it looks that indeed we have only D and G to deal with. So that's very nice. But F equals to one is, is for many reasons a very convenient case. And not such, you know, nice formulas of this type are not really available for uh, F equals, for example, even to two. So it's actually going from uh, from F1 to F2 is already a very high jump in complexity of the computations that we have. So then what I, what I thought last year was to take the advantage, to take advantage of the Ellingsrud, Goethe, and Len um, uh, result that tells us that these guys are only depend on the degree and the genus to try to find some nice formulas or at least to find some nice algorithm to, uh, to obtain them. So basically what I did was to say, okay, we can set up an induction because, because since I only care about the degree and the genus of the curve, it means that I can basically choose what curve I deal with. So if I take genus zero, then I can just work with P1 and I can take like the simplest possible line bundle of degree D on P1 that I can imagine. So this is the tautological bundle whose sections are uh, homogeneous polynomials of degree D in two variables. And once you do that, you have a really nice simplification of your situation because the symmetric product of P1 is actually PE. So that's really nice. It means that when I integrate something, I integrate over PE, so that's great for the fundamental class of PE. And moreover, uh, you can do a computation that tells you that the churn classes of this, of the tautological bundle corresponding to this bundle here are given exactly by this formula here where H is the hyperplane class inside of PR. So you have suddenly a lot of simplification and that's very nice, but how do I now, this is like the base case, how do I go higher? And the way you go higher is you use disjoint, sum, uh, disjoint unions. So I take a curve C1 and I say that this C, uh, C1 is the disjoint union of my P1 with some other curve C2, smooth, everything is smooth here. And then using the additivity of the Euler characteristic over such disjoint sums, you go to the conclusion 
that the genus of C2 is the genus of C1 plus one. Okay, so I can do something about, I can do an induction on the genus. But then I also need to move the degree in some way, but uh, with the degree, I also have that if L1 is a line bundle on C1, then, and this L1, so this is a line bundle on top of this disjoint, uh, disjoint union, which means that it's, well, a line bundle on here and a line bundle on there, right? The restrictions. And the degree of this guy is going to be exactly the sum of the two. Okay. But of course, uh, I also need to understand what happens with the direct, with the symmetric product, because so far I've only told you about the curve itself, but I also need to understand what happens to this guy. And well, it turns out that this is also a disjoint union of all of these products here. So I take an disjoint union over n plus m equals to e, and then here I have symmetric product of p1 n times and symmetric product of c2 m times. And then with the tautological bundle, things are also not too difficult. Um, here actually what is happening, uh, I, I would like to just tell you what these p1 and p2 are. These are just the projections because you see if I start with p1, symmetric product of p1 n times, and symmetric product of c2 m times, uh, and then I go to p1, and I go to C2, then uh, this is my projection P1, and this is my projection P2. So basically I have, uh, I have L1 on top here is just going to be the pullback of L here. I'm just denoting the L1 restricted to P1, I'm denoting it by L. So this is L n lives on P1 and L2 is the restriction of L1 to C2 here. So this guy lives here, this is L2. And so what L1 uh, E restricted to this factor here ends up being, or to this component here, sorry ends up being is the pullback of this by P1 and then a direct sum with the pullback of this guy here uh, onto the product. So this is what uh, I have written down here. So basically what I'm trying to say is that once I have a line bundle on P1 and once I have a line bundle on C2, then I can recover a line bundle on C1 and I understand also the topological bundle and I understand also the symmetric products. And basically I, I also understand how the genus changes and the degree. So I can set up an induction. And then once you set up this induction, you can turn the crank. And for example, I can show you a nice formula for a curve of degree four in, um, sorry, of genus, curve of degree four uh, and uh, of, of genus G. So these are uh, the secant, these are four secant, sorry, this, the, the, there is a really bad typo here. This is a curve <laughs> of degree D and of genus G and P3, and there are four secant uh, planes that intersect this, and this is the formula uh, that you get. And of course, as you can see, this is the kind of formula where you again don't really have nice positivity properties. It's not clear if I just input any G and D here that I'm going to get a positive number. So this is the kind of uh, problem that I would still like to, to consider and I, to try to refine uh, the methods that I, that I had before to obtain uh, such a result. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for your attention and uh, greetings from, well, it was snowy in Freiburg until two days ago, so <laughs> now it has melted. But <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mara.